you just bow your heads and agree with me. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that um, you accomplish goals, you accomplish dreams and visions through us. Uh, Father, as, as, as uh, Lord, you have, you've chosen me to be a vessel to deliver your word today, Lord. I, I pray that I just be that, Lord. And, 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 and if, if, if there's anything of me in this message, Lord, I, I pray that you would just remove it from the minds of the people. Uh, Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would just deliver this word through me. Uh, God, I am in desperate need of your assistance today. And Lord, I, I pray that for... Uh, for all of us out there in the congregation as well, we just desire to hear your voice. Uh, so, Lord, prepare in us your word. And, Lord, I, I just I just thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right. Okay, so our, our main verse today is going to be in uh, Proverbs 29, 18. That's the main verse today. So, like I was saying... Uh, and if, if you don't have a Bible, we have uh, some Bibles at the back. Um, if, if you don't have a Bible, uh, Reggie, you can pass them out. We have, a, we have quite a few, actually. So uh, just raise your hands, and Reggie will come by the aisle. So, again, like I was saying, Pastor had recently asked me to preach, and I had nothing on my mind to talk about, actually. But... Uh, you know, God is, God is so good. He's faithful. Uh, what, what came to mind, let's, let's go and read this verse and we can, we can share a little bit more about that. So it says, oh, I'm sorry. It's going to be Proverbs uh, 29 and 18. Wait till you guys get there. So it says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So this is, uh, this is not something new I, I, I just came across this past week. I mean, I've read it before, and, I, and I've uh, uh, seen this verse taught on. Um, there, but there's a couple aspects of this verse that... Uh, it really stood out to me uh, recently uh, during, I was out for a week and we were at vacation and stuff like that. And, uh, just just really seeing the beauty of God and how, how uh, in nature, they don't have, in nature you don't really have to worry about anything. Birds in the air, they, they don't have to worry about food, they don't have to worry about shelter. It, it kind of goes back to that verse, you know. But then, I, then, then I look at myself, and uh, you know, and I look at the scripture where there is no vision, the people perish. You know, uh, oftentimes I'm like, you know, even when I was like probably a student going to college, I didn't really know what my vocation was going to be. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, even up to the point where I graduated, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, but even right now, it's even more kind of. Uh, a blank stare or like a glossy gaze when you, you say, where do you see yourself in uh, just two years from now or even a year from now? I just look at myself and I say, well, I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at and I think that's where I'll be. But no one can really know for sure, you know? And it's sometimes we don't, we don't want to think about it. And that's, that's, that's when this verse comes into action. So, so what we're going to talk about today is two things. We're going to talk about vision, and then we're also going to talk about let. Actually, that's the title of the message, is let. So, I'm going to go ahead and read to you guys the a definition of vision, okay? From, from, from this proverb that we're reading here. It says, uh, this is from uh, the Webster's Dictionary. Uh, it says, it's the act of seeing external objects act of actual size. Faith here is turned into vision there. 
the, the, uh, the, the faculty of seeing sight, vision is far from perfect and acute in some animals and in men. Something imagined to be seen, not all real, a phantom, a specter, or a dream. Uh, in, in scripture, a revelation from God, an appearance or an exhibition, exhibition, okay, I can't say that, exhibition of, of something supernaturally presented to the minds of the prof, of the prophet, by which they were uh, informed of future events, such as visions uh, from Isaiah or Amos or Ezekiel. Something imaginary, a product of fancy, anything which is the sight of object. So it kind of goes everywhere. It kind of just kind of goes everywhere. Uh, as far as the definition of vision. Um, but uh, in this particular scripture, it, it's talking more uh, about when it says, you know, when there is no vision, the people perish. That actually is actually talking about what do you guys think? That's actually kind of talking about like a goal or a finishing point, right? Kind of like a revelation, an understanding of something. Basically, where you where you stand. You have to know where you're standing. So when, when we look at our lives, we say, okay, I see myself, I'm standing here, what, I, what, do, what do I see myself? Because a vision is something far off, okay? And like how the definition says, it's something that's uncertain, okay? So, oftentimes, when, I, when I'm thinking about that verse, I understand what the word vision means, I, I kind of like, okay, well, if I have a vision, so how do, we, how do we go about, or a goal, or a finishing point, how do I go about normally uh, in finishing it, or accomplishing it? Or like, I have a, if I have a task I have to do at work, what do I normally do? I, I, in, in a worldly view, we, we would normally just kind of look at this and say, all right, we'll just make it happen. We'll plan. We'll uh, we'll uh, do things. We'll set things in order so that this vision will come to happen, right? Right. And that's that's one way of looking at it. That's one way of looking at it. Um, but here, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a couple more scriptures here, and then but but then we're gonna go to we're gonna go in a story here. Jeremiah chapter 42 and 43, but I'm just going to share a uh, scripture here real quick from Proverbs again. And Proverbs is an awesome book for that. So, what the scripture also is stating here in, in uh, Proverbs 29 is saying, you know, if there is no vision, then depression. If there is no vision, then despair. If there is no vision, then no future. And then uh, Proverbs 16, 1, chapter 16 is a great illustration of, of, of how we sometimes, we want to put our hands into something and make it happen. I want that promotion at work. I want, uh, I want to have a good relationship with my, with my dad. I want to have a good relationship with my spouse. I want to have a good relationship with, I want to make friends. So you make stuff happen. But Proverbs says this, Proverbs 16, 1 through 3 says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own, own sight, but the, but the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your works to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The mind, the mind of man plans his ways, or the thoughts of a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. And so what does happen when you don't know where you're going to go? What happens when you don't have, you don't really have a goal? What happens when you really, you have like a, you know, a fuzzy picture of where you're supposed to be, but you have no idea no real idea of like, oh, I'm gonna be a CEO in like five years or something. Or, or okay, that's it's crazy. But, um, or, you know, you don't really have something that's tangible. 
but you're just out there. So let's kind of let's kind of look at uh, a, a a story where Jeremiah, well, actually the children of Israel was faced with uh, a decision and um, what they lack in their vision. So we're going to read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 42 and 43. Um, but I'll give you a quick setting of what's going on here in Jeremiah. So I'll start. I'll start here. You guys can stay on forty-two. I'm gonna start forty-one, verses sixteen and eighteen, real quick here. So, so the so, so the setting is uh, the northern kingdom of Israel have been taken over already, and Jeremiah is, a, is is known as the weeping prophet. You guys didn't know that he's a weeping prophet because he's crying all the time because. Nobody listens to them because there's going to be Israel's, the southern kingdom is going to be taken over by the Babylonians and just utterly destroyed. So he warns them and warns them and warns them and they don't, even, they, don't even take, they don't even acknowledge it. They actually threw him in prison, threw him in a mud hole where he was trapped in for quite a while until the Babylonian soldiers pulled him out after they took over Israel. So Babylonia. Uh, the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar had just recently taken over um, uh, the kingdom of Israel and he had appointed uh, a governor, a, a, Jew, a Jewish person to be governor at the time. And then, so basically, there was this guy, his name is Ishmael. Um, yeah, Ishmael. And then um, he was basically heir to the throne. So he was what, uh, from the bloodline that's going to be that would have been the king of Israel if the if not the uh, the Babylonians hadn't taken over. So he goes and he kills his governor, okay? Because you know he's probably pretty angry that uh, he didn't he wasn't the governor. So he kills the governor, and that's where our story kicks off. So the, the children of Israel, all the other governors, other the officials that has sworn allegiance to the Babylonian king. They come and they kill. They, they go fight against this guy that uh, assassinated um, the main governor. So it says here in sixteen. Then uh, Joanna, uh, Joanna, the son of Carian, Carian, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him took Mitzvah, all the remnant of the people who had recovered from Ish, Ishmael, the son of um, Nathaniel. After he had struck down uh, Gedaliah, the son of Hakimian. Okay, these names. Uh, that is the men who were soldiers. Uh, that is the men who were soldiers, the women, the children, and the eunuchs uh, whom he had brought from Gibon. And they went and stayed in Gerath, uh, Chiham. Uh, which is beside Bethlehem, in order to proceed into Egypt. But because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, since Ishmael, the son of Nethaniel, had struck down Jedala, the son of Hakim, whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. Wow, a lot of names, sorry. All right, I read them all. But anyway, so that's the setting right now. That's the setting now, because they they're afraid that since they did something uh, against the king King Nebuchadnezzar's appointed person, that they're going to be associated with this coup, this this uh, uprising. So they they, they, had, they had purposed in their hearts how they had purposed in their hearts how to escape this uh, outcome. Now, how many of you out there do something like this? You know, where you mess up. And then you try to find, and then you plan a way to kind of like clean up your mess, huh? How many of you? I'm gonna raise my hand, but you don't have to raise hand. But you know, you mess up, and you try to clean up your mess. It's like it's like asking Grace, you know, Grace, you know, mess up her, you know, probably had like you know, you had to use the restroom and had a dirty diaper now, and then Grace trying to clean up her mess, man. That's not gonna happen. I don't know, right, great right, yeah. Brother, brother, uh, brother Dion and Ashley, yeah, those guys will have to clean up the mess. But, uh, <laughs> but that's how it is sometimes. We make a mess, and we we plan, and we we even scheme. Okay, I'm gonna use the word scheme. Okay, we even scheme. We even we even like try to like 
uh, make it so that we look innocent or something like that. Um, that's just how deceptive we are. But I want you to keep that in mind. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of this. We're going to go on. I'll, I'll, I'll finish this real quick. We're going to read this. Uh, then all the commanders uh, of the forces of uh, jo Joanna, the son of Korea, uh, Korea, uh, Jez Jezana, the son of Ho Hoshana, and all the people, uh, both small and great, approached and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petitions come before you and pray for us to the Lord your God. That is for all this remnant, because we are left but a few out of many, as your eye, as your own eyes now see us. That the Lord your God may tell us the way in which we should walk and the thing that we should do. And Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I am going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words. And I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer you. I will keep back, uh, I will not keep back a word from you. Then uh, they said to Jeremiah, may the Lord be true and faithful and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which the Lord your God will send you to, send you to us. Whether it be a pleasant or unpleasant, we will listen to the voice of the Lord, our God, to whom we are sending you, so that it may go well with us when we listen to the voice of the Lord, our God. Now at the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Okay, I'll stop there for a moment. So, these guys are desperate. They just killed the king's man, and they're so desperate that they they, they go back to Jeremiah, who, who 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 stated who prophesied that Israel would fall, but they didn't believe him then. But now they're so desperate, they're they're just willing to you know hey this guy let's go let's go to the man of God and let's see what God has planned for us. Let's just do what God wants us to do. All right. How many of you do that? I know, I know, I do that all the time. I do that all the time at work. If if, if there's a if, if like a system goes down, I work with computers. So like if a system goes down, I just if I if I don't know the answer, I just I fall on my knees. I'm like, oh right, well, you gotta fix this. You gotta fix this. You gotta fix this because if you don't fix this, I ain't gonna fix it. <laughs> I have no way of fixing this. So so we are desperate. Whenever we're desperate, we always. We often sign seek we seek God. And that's true. So I'm gonna keep reading here. And now at the end of ten days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Then he called to uh, Joanna the son of Korea and all the commanders of the forces that were with him, and for all the people, both great and small, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your petition. For him. If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down, and I will plant you and not uproot you, for I will, uh, relent, I will relent concerning the calamity that I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are now fearing. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hands. I will also show you compassion. So that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your own soil. But if you are going to say, I will not stay in this land. So that so as not to listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Saying, no, but we will go on to the land of Egypt. Where we will not see war or hear the sound of a trumpet or hunger for bread. And will stay there. Then in that case, listen to the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord. Of hosts, the God of Israel. If you really set your minds to enter Egypt and go in and to reside there, then the sword which you are afraid of will overtake you in the land of Egypt, and the famine about which you are anxious about will follow closely after you in Egypt, and you will die there. Whoa. So all the men who set their minds to go to Egypt. 
to reside there will die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, and they will have no survivors or refugees from the calamity that I am going to bring on them. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my wrath have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt, and you will become a curse and an object of horror, an uh, imprecation and a reproach, and you will see this place no more. The Lord has spoken to you, O remnant of Judah. Do not go into Egypt. You should clearly understand that today I have testified against you. For you have only deceived yourselves. For it is you who sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God. And whatever the Lord our God says, tell us so, and we will do it. So I have told you today, but you have not obeyed the Lord your God, even in whatever he has sent me to tell you. Therefore, you should now clearly understand that you will die by the sword, by the famine and the pestilence in the place where you wish to go to reside. And then 13 more chapter, 13 more verses and we're done. But as soon as Jeremiah, whom the Lord their God has said, had finished telling the people all the words of the Lord, their God, that is all these words. Azariah son of Hosh, Hoshina and Joanna the son of Kirith and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent me to say, to say you are not to enter Egypt or to reside there. But Barsha, the son of Nira, is, in it, in it, is enticing you against us to give us over to the hand of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. So they will put us to death or exile us to Babylon. So Joanna, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to stay in the land of Judah. But Joanna the son of Korea and all the commanders of the forces took the entire remnant of Judah who had returned from all the nations to which they had been driven away in order to reside in the land of Judah. The men and women, the children and the king's daughters and every person that Nebuchadnezzar, the captain, oh sorry, Neba, Neba Bazarin, the Bizarden, the captain of the bodyguard, and Malef, uh, Gildesh, the son of Akima, and the grandson of uh, Shirfan, together with Jeremiah the prophet, and Persia the son of Judah. And they had entered the land of Egypt. They did not obey the voice of the Lord, and went as far as Hephis, Hephis, yeah, Hephis, Hephis, Hephis. Okay, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and Timothy, saying, Take some large stones in your hands and hide them in the mortar and in the brick terrace. Okay, so Jeremiah's going to tell them, uh, do an object lesson, show them how Babylon's going to come and basically destroy Egypt, if you continue reading. So we'll, we'll stop there. I kind of get the gist of it. Um, so re remember, these people are a remnant of Israel. These were, these were people that left like as refugees away from like after war right and so after they heard that um, it was okay for them to come back to Judah they came back and so they're still frightened okay they're still uh, in all of what King Nebuchadnezzar can do to them very easily he can kill them very easily so um what do you think the people's vision was? What was their morale? Part of their low. They didn't have a vision. They're going to be slaves to this king that just, you know, killed their king, killed their officials, took some back to be slaves in Babylon, or taken from their nation. And then what they did was they asked Jeremiah. They got on their knees and they, they got to, and, and they begged Jeremiah to to tell them what to do. Can you can you go ask God for us? Can you can you ask God what our direction is? What should we do? What is our future? How does our future look like? Right now I see no future. But they already purposed in their heart that they were going to go to Egypt. You know? 
and 40 and 41 they were already getting gathering up and then basically you know what that's like saying that's like saying um, I'm gonna do this Lord I'm gonna go do this sin or I'm gonna go and do this but I'm gonna ask your favor in it. that's what that's like how it's saying that I, I don't care if you want me to do this or not but all I'm asking for is your favor I just want to know that you and me are right but I'm gonna do this anyway Okay, so even before they asked, that's why Jeremiah, I mean, you find it funny when Jeremiah just tells him, you know, okay, you, you told me, you asked me what God thinks. I'm going to tell you what God thinks, but I know you're not going to listen anyway. That's basically what 40, 42 says. And then what happens in 43, chapter 43? The guy that asked him, I think his name is Joanna, I think. The guy that asked him goes up and says, hey, you're lying. God didn't tell you to let us stay here. God wants us to live, all right? He doesn't want me to die here, all right? Because right here, right now, my place where I'm at, I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die. You see, like I said, a vision is not something real, okay? A vision is something that you hope for. So a vision is something that's, that you, you, you make up sometimes. You just make up sometimes. And, and, and what they all they saw around them, all they saw around them in Judah, the place where they grew up, the place, their nation, all they saw was death. They saw slavery. They saw death. Uh, you know, anything you see that is worse. And, and, and I want you to apply that in your life. All right? Maybe the place that you're in right now is like death for you, okay? Maybe you have no vision. Maybe you, maybe it seems like you have no future, but you're just gonna you're just gonna be in this position forever. You're just gonna be unhappy forever. But that's okay, God. I'll just be, you know. But you want to act. You want to act. So these people, they want to act. They don't. They're not gonna. But I mean, I give them. You know, I give them. You know, I understand them. If I knew my my position right now was just death, I would want to get out of there. That's just the natural way of. Of, of how things go, you know, um, like even right now in my my workplace, I'll show you guys I'll share a little bit. Um, we we're, we're going through uh, a transitioning time where they're gonna they call it real a uh, real organization basically. So they're gonna uh, take jobs, scramble them around, and see see who who needs who still needs to be here, who not who, who doesn't need to be here anymore. So. I mean, you can look at that. You can look at that. I can look at that and say, all right, well, I better get out of here because I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a spot for me. But you know, there's also another option. There's always another option. Because sometimes we, we, look at, we look at our options are slim, in the face of danger, in, 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 in a place where we, we feel like it's like, okay, people call it hell, you know? But I tell you, hell is far worse, okay? Far worse. Far worse than what you feel right now. But you, you want to make a decision. You feel like you need to make a decision. See, the children of Israel, their vision wasn't really clear. Because all they saw was death around them. And they made their judgment. And they decided in their hearts because of what, what they saw around them. And they, they couldn't get past. They couldn't, they couldn't get past the verse, okay? They couldn't get past the verse that says, without a vision, the people will perish. And that's all they could saw in that verse. So this is what God made a lie about on that verse, okay? This, the, the second portion of the verse says, I'll read, it from, I'll read the verse again. It says, uh, I'll, I'll read it in the uh, King James, and I'll also read it in the Amplified. It says, Where there is no vision of people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. But he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, 
fortunate and enviable is he? See, they didn't see that column. They stopped right at the column. They didn't see the second portion of the verse that says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Some of you are wondering, what do you mean by keeping the law? You know, I was wondering that too. What does that mean? What does that mean? I want you to turn to uh, uh, Jeremiah, uh, no, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. Okay, we still got a bit, so uh, I'll wait for you guys to get there. So it says here in John chapter 12, it is talking about the Pharisees because they made their decision quite quickly after uh, they saw Jesus in it, and they thought they thought he could have been Messiah, but then uh, they had a different turn of events. It says, yet, this is John chapter 12, 42 and 43, yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him. It's talking about Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for the fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love human praise more than the praise from God. That, that's a factor. That's a factor. You know, I gotta, I gotta have my reputation. My reputation has to be right. You know, people they, they look at reputation and they, they, they almost account it to as equaling to like uh, just being happy. If you have a good reputation, then you'll be happy. If you, if you, if you're making a lot of money, you'll be happy. So to have a bad reputation or to have no money means that. You're basically in that same position where Israel's at. We have to make a decision. But um, but the praise of man, man, I tell you, the praise of man, that, that's that's one that will, will just cloud our vision up, cloud our vision up, and not make us see straight. Our peers, social pressures, media. Hey, you're supposed to act like this. You're supposed to be this way. Satan uses all he can to scare us. Satan uses anything he can. And we have to be ready for that. We have to see. We have to love God. We have to love God. So let's go back to Israel here. So the people's vision was not clear. They could not see what was going to happen. They were completely unsure. Man, when you're unsure, man, that's just a pretty ground for Satan, man. We got to be sure about God. The fear, of, the fear of the future controlled their actions. They were under bondage. And basically, they were under bondage basically because they didn't have straight their view of God. They didn't, know, they didn't see God as a person that fulfilled his promises. Okay? See, our God, he's about freedom. He's about freedom, man. He's not about bondage. We, we, that's what that's what you that's what you hear from uh, folks that are, are still in the world. No, you can't do this. You can't do that. You, you're 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 bound to him. You, you gotta you gotta do you gotta do ten of these commandments or you're out. You know. But our God is about freedom. Our God is about hey man, I do those things because I want to. So instead of hearing God's word, they allow uncertainty and fear control their heart. See, everybody's a slave to something, you know. I'd rather be a slave to God. I'd rather be a slave to God than be a slave to my sin or my fear or my doubt. There's people that live like that every day. You gotta pray for those people. So, let's see here. Sorry. So the word of God. That's the freeing part. That's the freeing part. We need to we need to uh, see, see uh, God's character revealed in His Word. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna share I'm gonna share two more scriptures here. It says um, in Numbers 23:19. You don't have to turn there if you want to. Uh, uh, and also in Matthew 24:35. Uh, and this is just a just a view of God of God of who God is. Because sometimes we, our, our view of God we we just say we just think that hey God might not come through. This is the same view as the Israelites did. But I want I want to. I, I want you to settle these things in your heart. There's two things I want you to settle in your heart. But, but first we're going to talk about the character of God. Okay, you gotta, you gotta, that's, that, okay three things. Four things. You got to eat God's word. All right? Devour him. And you got to trust his character. And his character, the only way you're going to get this character is you read the word of God. Okay? That's how you know him. Okay? How, that's how you know people through their words. And another another word for promise is word. Do you keep your word? Okay, we're men of a word. Our word. So God uses this. It's, it's just funny how in the English language we can use this word, the word word, and, and it means so many different things. But God will think that. So God keeps His word. It says in Numbers twenty three nineteen it says God is not a man that He should lie, nor a son of man that He should repent. Has He said and will He not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? That's right. He does. He always does what he says. He never goes back on his word, even though it seems like it's not going to happen. He does. It. I got a lot of testimonies here myself, and I know people out there have got a lot of testimonies. Gas and even though. In Matthew twenty-four thirty-five, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. All right. So if he had promised you a long time ago, he promised you a long time ago that he's, he's going to see you through something. He will. All right. He will. Even though it seems like it's not going to happen, he will. He will. We just got to. So we got to settle these things. Um, two things. We got to love God's word. We have. To love God's word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. So you gotta eat his words, you gotta read it. And your words became to me for me a joy and a delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. We have to love God's word. And then we have to keep his word. Just like Job did. <coughs> Job chapter 23. Verse 12 says, I have not departed from the commandments of your lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. All right? Necessary food. What does that mean? That means the food that I need to survive. You know, I can, I mean, some of you fast out there. You can, you can probably fast probably two or three days without food, but there's a point where you need food. Your body needs food or you're going to die. So this is the necessary food that Job is talking about. So we have to settle these two things. Love God's word. Settle? Oh, four, three things. I'm sorry. Love God's word. Be precise and, and trust in his character. And also keep his promises or his word. Keep his word like it's your necessary food. So like, if you're without it, you're going to die. So you need his word daily. But then you, you may ask, what is, what is that all about? You know, how, do I, how, how in the world can that help me? And I ask myself that too, actually. But, sorry, I have a whole bunch of notes up here. So, I want you guys to turn to Colossians chapter 1. Hope this is all making sense. Father, I'm in jail. <laughs> um, so Colossians 1 says this. So oftentimes God asks, God asks us to do something we feel that is impossible. Something that's irrational. But the fact of the matter is that He's not really asking us to do anything at all. Because what he's... Because he, he knows what we're capable of doing. We're capable of failing. 
Adam proved that right away when we did the apple. Um, but he's not asking us to do anything irrational. He's not asking us to do anything impossible. What he's truly asking us is for us to trust him. That's what he's asking us to do. That's what he's asking us to do today. Would you just let, would you let God work in your heart? Will you let God work out this problem for you? Would you let God control this area of your life so he can take you out of it? Or keep you in it and raise you up? Whatever it might be. But let's look at Col Colossians 1. Because it says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Colossians 1. 3 to 6. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of uh, which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. So the key to keeping God's word, because this saying is, is telling us that the gospel is continually growing. Even without you. Okay? That's kind of weird. Um, so the gospel's growing even without you. I look, I look at it sometimes and I say, you know, I don't have to be a part of this gospel movement. But you know what? In my heart I know that God's word, his seed, his gospel, the truth, the good news, the good word, it's going to complete his will. All right? It's going to have its way on earth. No matter what Satan or this world's going to do, he's going to have his way. It's going to have its way. It says in Isaiah uh, uh, 55, 11, it says, So will my word be which, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. You see, the gospel, when you first heard the word of God, when you first received Christ in your heart, it began to work already. You didn't, you don't even know. We didn't know. We didn't know what we received. Alright? But when you received God's word, there was a seed that was planted in your heart. I want you guys to turn to Luke chapter 8. You see, even, even when you feel there's like no future for you, no vision, no goal, whether, whether it be in relationships, your job, or your purpose, let God work it out. Alright? Now that doesn't mean you just sit at home and do nothing, okay? And that doesn't mean God helps to help, uh, God doesn't help those who help themselves, because that's a lie. Because God helps the helpless, okay? That's what Psalm says, okay? Alright? Because you know, you were helpless once, and God picks you up and sets your feet on solid ground. It's a song from Psalms. <laughs> you know, that's true. That's true in all our lives. But what I'm saying, I mean, I've heard this thought before. Success is something, is something that you, you is, success is just doing the right thing until it finds you. All right? I've heard that said before, and I believe it. I believe it. Bible says to be a good steward of your work, uh, of your time. Be a good steward of your time. Bible says be a good steward of your money. Be a good steward of your money. Bible says time, time. Bible says, uh, you know, love, uh, love someone just the way you love yourself. You know, do that. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Do that. It's a matter of just doing the, the right things. Continually doing them. And then 
God gives you through that time. It's just your time to receive what God has to give you. It's not about it's not about sitting back, but it's about doing what's right. Doing doing the right things that God has called you to do. And you staying faithful to it. Because God's just not gonna give the the I was gonna say plantation. The, the farm over. He's just not gonna give his uh, his riches over to, to an unfaithful steward, okay? His vineyard, okay, we use vineyard. That's what we're gonna talk about, I think. So he's not just gonna give his vineyard over to any anybody. Alright? But he loves us so much, he lets us keep trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. But success is just allow, just doing the right things until until I was talking to Holly this morning. Until it gets from here to your heart. Because I can ha- I can think right. And I can acknowledge the right things that I do. And I can say, oh, this is what the Bible says. I can give you the right answer. But that's all mental. Until it becomes second nature and it comes from my heart. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, whatever you store in your heart, that's what comes out. Whatever comes out is what you store in your heart. So let's, let's clean house. Let the Holy Spirit clean our hearts out. And then let the seed of God grow. Just let it grow. Because the gospel is already growing right now in the world. Even though you're around, you don't even know, but the gospel is growing. So, why did I say all that? Okay, yeah. Okay, we're going to Luke 8, that's why. I have to turn to it. Okay, Luke 8. We're going to, and I promise you this is going to be pretty much it. We're going to, this is the last scripture we're going to look at. So this is the tree. Uh, this is the chief uh, parable. All right, we're gonna look at Luke's version of it. But Matthew says, in Matthew, Jesus says, if you don't, if you don't get anything at all, get this. All right, you know the parable, the kingdom the parable. This parable explains all other parables. That's what it says in Matthew. And I gotta, I can show you the scripture after words where it says it. But anyway, Jesus says, this is the parable, if you don't understand any parable, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to get any of the other parables, okay? So I'm just going to read to you um, his explana- the, the, explana- the parable and the explanation. So it's very important that you get this. So Luke 8, we're starting from 4. It says, when a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by the way of a parable. A, ser- a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it was choked, and it choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said to you, and he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables. It, it's in, it is in parables. So they may see, um, uh, so that they see, they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. So you quote Isaiah there. Now the parable is this. The seed is, what? The word of God. That's what the seed is. That's why the word is so important. You gotta love it. You gotta eat it. You gotta keep it. Those beside the road are those who have heard, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. So that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they heard, uh, heard receive the word with joy, and these with no firm and, and these have no firm root. The rocky soil. 
They believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones that have heard, have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. And bring no fruit to maturity, to take over our heart. You know? But this is God. This is God. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of God richly dwell in you. He wants to dwell in you. He doesn't want to say, Hey, how you doing? And then leave you. He wants to go in. The Bible says, Make his abode. Okay? Make his dwelling place. Make his life. That's where he wants to live. Alright? He wants to live here in your heart. I have a story I want to share with you and we're going to close. True story. Um, it's, it's kind of funny actually, but anyway. Um, so we have this peach tree in my backyard. We currently have right now. Uh, it's amazing how it grew too because we were just eating peaches and we threw the seed in the backyard. And then all of a sudden, like, we saw sprouts and we're like, oh no way, we have a peach tree. Actually, we did that with a lot of our stuff. Actually, we have we have Asian pears now like that. We just threw a seed out and it grew. Praise the Lord, man. I tell you, I told you, man, it's true. You just you know, the sower throws it, and it's uh, good soil, it's gonna grow, man. So we have fruit right now. We do we do have uh, Asian pears, we have peaches. But this is like uh, when it this is like when the tree just started growing bigger, right? And it's so there's these uh, peaches that were growing from it. This is like a store-bought peach tree that we peach peach that we ate in the grow. It's just amazing. I still and all that. But um, but we have these peaches that are on the tree. And they're not fully ripe yet, okay? They're like probably about that small, right? So my dad, he's retired now, he's at home all the time. So so he he, he we have like uh, the patio door. And then so he's like, you know, if he's cooking or he's doing something by the kitchen, he'll he'll see these squirrels and they would just come. And they just steal them and eat them, right? Like, like pretty soon we're not gonna have any peaches, all right, on this tree. So my dad came with like came up with this ingenious idea, this really smart idea of taking like you know cloth or something, and he covers the fruit, only the fruit, okay? So it's like yeah, fruit, okay, we just cover the fruit. What's we'll hide the fruit? And then so. Um, that solved the problem because we saw squirrels get there and they just like really look at it and like, hmm, no fruit on the tree, so they leave, right? So, but these fruit, they were covered completely, okay? You couldn't even see them. So, you know, you know, June came along, July came along, okay, harvesting time, right? So they're like, uh, okay, well, I bet you those uh, peaches are gonna be good to eat now, right? So my dad, he goes out, he takes off the pieces of cloth, and to his shock, guess what? The peaches were the same size still. They never grew. They never grew. They never grew. So now we don't put cloth on it. But, but, the, but, but the whole idea is this. The whole idea is this. If you don't let, if you hide the word of God, if you, if you hide your fruit, that's why I said, you know, it's not a testimony unless you tell it. All right? But, but it's, that's not about doing testimonies or whatever. But it's about the, letting the Word of God out, okay? Because you can hide these things. You can keep yourself from growing, okay, guys? We can, we can try to put our hands into our mess and try to fix it. We can try our best to get clean from our filth and our dirt and, and our past sin and, and everything. But that's not gonna, that's not, that you can't, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. So God has just asked you, just like that peach tree, hey, just, just trust me. Let me work it out. Let me, let my hands go through and fix this. Could you put your hands, could, would you just move, remove your hands from the problem? Would you just stop thinking about the problem and focus on me? In our relationship, because if you do that, I my hands will move. That will allow my hands to move. So with that being said, I, I want you guys to bow your heads.
We're just gonna I'm just gonna allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. The Bible says, let the word of God richly dwell in you. Let the word of God richly dwell in you. Father, we are, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are so desiring to, to rid us of all our problems and our cares, Lord. Lord, in fact, you worry the most for us. Lord, in fact, you want us out of this situation more than we do. And Father, we, we've, been, we've been like the children of Israel, and all we can see is death around us. All we can see is all our past failures. All we can see is that there's no future for us where we're at. But Father, we just, we, just, we just ask in our heart of hearts, Lord, you know our heart of hearts. You know, Father God, that we desire your presence. We desire your freedom. We desire your love. But Father, I pray, Lord, we need, we need a lot of fixing to be done in our hearts. We, not, we need a lot of fixing to be done in our, our habits that we picked up in this lifetime. Father, we just, we just want to allow you to reign fully. We just want to let you work on us. Father, search our hearts. Holy Spirit, search our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just take a moment to search your heart. Open your heart wide for him, because he wants to enter in. Maybe he's already there also. Maybe he just needs more room. Allow him to just pull out everything. Everything that you're keeping him out of. Break down the walls. that's you today that I'm talking about, that we're preaching about, may the Holy Spirit just come and convict you and show you and convince you that He loves you, that He's right there for you. I'm just going to pray a prayer for you guys right now. If you need prayer, we're going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up here, but I'm going to pray this prayer of closing first. Holy Father, I thank you, Lord. That you searched us and you know us. You know where we are at, God. Lord, today I just want to consider these three things, Lord. Lord, I just want to consider trusting you, letting myself trust you. Today I just want to consider letting you, letting myself believe in what you told me about yourself. And Lord, I just want to let your word work in. God, we just give you praise and glory. We thank you, Lord. That we'll love your word and we'll keep it, Lord. And Lord, give us strength, Father God, when it seems impossible. Give us strength when there's no future. Lord, I just lift up each one here today, Lord Jesus. Throughout this week, Lord, encourage them in your word, Father God. Because it will complete its perfect will in them. It will fulfill their destiny. It will do what you desire it to do. So Father God, let us be, let, let us, let the soil of our hearts be ready for you. Let it be moldable, let it be fertile, Father God. Lord, we just, we just want all of you. We just want all of you, we don't want to miss your mess. We want to see your fruit grow in us. And Father, we just give you praise. I pray that you be with uh, the congregation as they leave, Father God. I pray that you would just touch lives. Touch lives. Use their life to touch another person's life this week. And Lord, we just give you all praise. Lord, we're just, we're just unworthy servants, Father, doing what you've asked us to already do. So Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege to just be in your presence, the privilege, Father God, to share your word. And Lord, we just give you praise, Father God. And I pray that you just be with your people. Lord, just love them today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.